City Adventure Touch, Mystery of Triangle by Toho and Compile, circa 1987, based on an old manga turned anime of the same name by Mitsuru Odachi and others. And well, what do you know, we've got another import on our hands. Considering no one's even heard of, let alone read or seen any media related to Mitsuru Adachi's touch, since it's popular in Japan, but, uh, I don't know, nowhere else. And forgiven the international otaku bashing in advance, see why all these other franchises that are worth a damn? Hence these visuals shown here, which I'm in no position to name drop whatsoever, except through these grotesquely familiar stills. See why they're overrated as all motherfucking get out! Anyhow, all minimal venting aside, the Uesugi twins, Tatsuya and Kazuya, okay, not going there. Both athletes, naturally gifted and hardworking individually, are plunged into an alternate dimension while chasing after their pet Samoya dog Punch, along with their more athletic and strong-willed next-door neighbor slash crush, Minami Asakura. The only way to get their pet back, as it turns out, is to explore that very same dimension's maze-like rendition of their hometown, namely Minami Kaze, or South Winds, while locating and rescuing ten other dogs and facing numerous creatures and machines along the way. Gameplay-wise, it's an almost 2.5D open-world brawler, predating the already defunct Technos Japan's Renegade, Double Dragon, despite that game making its debut the same fucking year as this shit, and even River City Ransom. Where you're guiding the main trio, both the aforementioned Tatsuya and Kazuya, with Minami in the center, whom you have to protect at any cost, all throughout the so-called alternate dimension of Minami Kaze, confronting and clobbering the piss out of every miscellaneous adversary, including living toys, machines, balloons, bats, skeletons, ghosts, living mushrooms, animals including rats, rabbits, bears, and the like, and discovering hidden paths whenever and wherever feasible in order to bring back the ten lost dogs, including Punch, of course. Both Tatsuya and Kazuya have their individual health meters in the form of three-digit numbers, which also serve as their currency. Metroid anyone? Gained by throwing down the old fisticuffs or summoning random-ass projectiles on said adversaries that appear in random locations within their inverted, alternate empty shell of a town, while Minami does dick all except appear as an accessory to the twins' ongoing pursuits. Whenever the twins endure any amount of damage, and forgive any wanton misogyny on my part, all she can do is wince, whine and dine, and bitch non-stop, as most girls do, even in real life, I might add. But more on all this shit later! Control-wise, the D-pad navigates the trio anywhere to their heart's content, screen by screen, whether exterior or interior, select swaps between Tatsuya and Kazuya whenever necessary, and accesses a randomly generated set of passwords for each of the three characters, but only while paused, whereas B attacks and A does jack shit except swap items and weapons in conjunction with left or right on the D-pad, and in order to discard any secondary and or pointless red herring item, just push B and A simultaneously, the latter of which can be accomplished within any or relevant property where the statue says fuck all. These items, by the way, can be bought at any DIY vendor store, including sustenance that also replenishes their health, but at the same time refund their moolah. Regarding the weaponry, both Tatsuya and Kazuya use baseballs, cause again it's based on a manga anime franchise centering around athleticism, or punch normally if not equipped. Not to mention knives, dolls, flammable moccasins, including matches, and the like. Some of which are either useful or useless, depending on the situations that call the most for them. Especially the area-specific boss creatures the trio must face and topple to bring back the other captive dogs. As massive as the area they travel in appears to be, unless you're fully aware of where the fuck to go and what the fuck to do, be prepared to get goddamn lost, perplexed, and burned the fuck out easily, and very often too, I might add. Should either or both Tatsuya and Kazuya's life and cash meters deplete all the way from excessive damage, or depending how one perceives the situation, robberies, it's an instant Jesus Christ God motherfucking casserole drinking, kidney bleeding, and coyote sperm puking damn game over, so I'd watch their asses, and especially Minami's, every step of the damn way if I were you. As the trio's search and rescue operation transpires, their first captive dog is found right at the very beginning, and the remaining nine, including the twins' pet Punch, are released upon the demise of certain boss creatures, or in other cases, visiting a mandatory hidden area and or completing a certain mandatory objective, with the former being the most common strategy throughout. <laughs> The 
first boss you'll come across is in a hidden, bleak-looking, miniaturized ghost town, inhabited by your usual horror fair oppressors, specifically those aforementioned bats and skeletons with some fucking ghosts mixed in even. Quick, call Pete Ray, Egon Winston, and Lewis for all I care, within the locked drugstore that you have to access via a magic key, specifically a living Gwen clown doll that summons its own offspring, against whom you need a discount Jenny doll to counter it. The next being a gigantic duck-like cloud of smoke, against which you'll need any flammable item, preferably a goddamn torch. Located within a forest on the outskirts of the alternate Minami Kaze, inhabited by rabbits, mushrooms, bubbles, moving stones, and the like. A massive spitting mutant rock, for whom you need the hammer to annihilate. A living machine wreaking havoc inside the trio's high school, for which you need a glass of water to demolish and short-circuit the fuck out of. A gargantuan crab within a cave at Minamikaze Beach. Shit, typical much? For which you need tomatoes to smother the shit out of. <laughs> yeah, as if we're going there this week. And finally, a colossal pooch in the temples, my guess being the hypnotized punch, for which you need the red ring to bring down before getting to the final two captive dogs, that is if you've managed to rescue the first eight by that point. Regarding the latter, in terms of finding the other remaining captive dogs via hidden areas or other miscellaneous, albeit mandatory, means, I'll leave those up to everyone, since I'm contemplating on eschewing all spoilers for good, even at this juncture, I might add. Usually, I don't rave much over how effortless any in-game boss confrontation is, at least for the sake of making every playthrough a walk in the park, but holy piss-drinking pub shit, what an irreversible-ass exception I'm making here! It's no wonder Mitsuru Adachi, the original creator of Touch, that is, was extremely pissed off over the way this game turned out to be, considering it had jack shit to do with his original work! I mean, what the fuck? Either way, at least the controls are self-aware enough and react decently to every basic action, despite one of the two twins unintentionally aiming in the wrong direction when controlling the other, causing Minami to throw one random fit after another, in which case, swap between the two whenever necessary, and the gameplay cycle is nothing short of adequate and unambiguous, albeit somehow humdrum and superfluous, where I'm not intended, though not as much as, say, the already defunct LucasArts infamous Defenders of Dinatron City, Christ forbid. <laughs> Concerning Touch, Mystery of Triangle's Challenge, one may think I'm flogging a dead-ass horse on what I've been deliberating over and over in this review as opposed to what I haven't, but let's just face facts here. As balanced as the difficulty level attempts to be, it's truly teetering on the brink of a fucking milk run, despite how certain enemies can't be toppled. Case in point, the fucking balloons, regardless of how many hits they'll take, in which case, just haul ass and find a possible safe haven, if you're able to. Switching out and or discarding certain items, especially those deemed to be pointless, aren't much of a bitch either, except if there's anything that's of the greatest possible importance. Finding out where the Christ you're supposed to go, however, is an entirely different ballgame, pun officially intended, and whenever you visit the statues in certain houses, trees, buildings, and the like, they'll no doubt lay down a hint or two related to the trio's overall objectives or supply them with the necessary items to further their quest some of which start out straightforward, but later sound more vague, and in the process, raise more fucking red flags than a godforsaken communist party. In full personal admittance, the first time I've tried this out nearly two decades ago, pre-YouTube that is, I barely had any goddamn idea whatsoever on the main destinations and or objective until discovering game FAQs in various walkthrough videos years later prior to starting this project. For starters, you'll definitely need that magic key in order to warp into certain subspace areas outside Minami Kaze, and even deliver and or receive letters at the post offices whenever necessary. Not only that, when facing those earlier sighted boss creatures, undivided scrutiny and attrition are key, especially when they strike back. Also, it's best to divide up how many of the captive dogs the twins rescue upon the demise of every prick-ass, cock-devouring boss creature, even when playing this in two-player mode with someone else, should such an opportunity happen to come about, that is, because it'd be an extremely agonizing shame to have one character soak up all the glory, or just leave the main objective to one of the twins. Like, seriously, who gives a shit? Besides all of those, please refer to and take strenuous advantage of what I discussed about those randomly generated passwords accessed only when paused via select. Not to mention every hint I've dropped thus far, if in full honesty, not a lot. And there's even a continue option in case the trio happens to exhaust themselves, but only after they die and not after you reset. Oh, by the way, should you desire to start from scratch, except with a quote-unquote mysterious glitched super weapon, type the following passwords 
Minamini Echi Shite Shimaimashita. Translation, I want to have sex with Minami for both Tatsuya and Kazuya. And finally, Tatsuya to Echi Shite Shimaimashita. Or Kazuya to Echi Shite Shimaimashita. Translations, I want to have sex with either Tatsuya or Kazuya, respectively, for Minami. <music> Graphically, as typical of every NES title, or Famicom in this case, Every background set resembles not only its source material, complete with even coastal settings and almost foreign contemporary urban settings meshed in, the Uesugi twins and even Minami are represented well for the most part, both in-game and during the opening title and menu and ending sequences, which, in total irreversible honesty, is more than I can fucking express about the generic-ass, monotonous-ass cast of adversaries they discover and scuffle with on a frequent goddamn basis, with maybe the exception of the bosses featured at the end of every major area. Getting back to the main trio themselves, one can't deny that Minami by herself has her plethora of moments, even when Tatsuya and Kazuya find themselves in the deepest shit imaginable, or when they explore new areas, hence her provided dialogue at the top center panel between the twins' UI and status details, which, as I'm sure many have noticed by now, I've managed to translate on screen myself. The twins are far from shabby and unremarkable as their constant efforts in keeping their oppressive hostile parties at bay, while also keeping their better half out of harm's way are evident, and then some. Music and sound-wise, while there's no credits shown whatsoever, nor any composer, though, according to my recent research, as mistaken as I could be, a pre-Godzilla Masatomo Miyamoto might have had something to do with it, and fuck no, he's not related to Shigeru, at all. But the sound driver responsible, Takayuki Hirono, at the already defunct Compile, was much more involved. But then again, who gives a fuck? You're better off looking the other way regarding the choice of songs, as it turns out to be a rather sparse selection no matter what situation the trio's hurled into. However, I may just be talking out of my own ass, as the range of songs become surprisingly more diverse and ear-opening beyond imagination. But yet again, let's face facts. They're more redundant than every motherfucking parental and or spousal lecture in history. And don't even get me started, for the sake of piss, about the less than serviceable sound effects either. Granted, they're also typical of every early Famicom, aka NES title, and are somewhat necessary for every in-game confrontation, but just, what the fuck is this? I don't even... Anyways, snapping back to reality, to be fair, here are my top 6 tracks. Main theme B, heard upon entering opposite buildings and or alternate exterior areas of towns, considering the theme A does clash with it. The bleak town theme when entering through the locked drugstore with a magic key, the woods, the warehouse and beach, the shrine path and finally the password. Replay value-wise, even at this very juncture, there's fuck all else to comment on, in spite of all the minor yet immediate potential this game holds due to the insanely gargantuan open world it features, apart from the basic teamwork strategies and the few oppressive yet profound and legitimate reviews towards it which I've seen and read and highly respect due to its obvious deep can't-miss flaws. I may occasionally return every now and again to the near-unsolvable mystery of Triangle, courtesy of the world of Adachi's touch, and the same yet currently long-since-defunct development team responsible for Xanak, Lunar Pool, Guardian Legend, Godzilla, Power Strike, Gun Knack, Musha, short for Metallic Uniframe Super Hybrid Armor, Space Mega Force, Robo LSD, Puyo Puyo, and a few of their Americanized variations. I'm looking at you, Dr. Robotnik's Mean Bean Machine, and especially you, Kirby's Avalanche. Despite not hitting it big with the latter eight until following this game, then again, maybe not. Henceforth, my final verdict in a nutshell, there are absolutely no words to express my ultimate, overall judgment on yet another often berated import title, other than how torn and divided I am, internally. On one side of me, I should at least continue experiencing what it has to offer, but on the other, maybe I shouldn't have laid a hand on it in the first place. 
Not even with a goddamn 25 foot branch. Like Jesus titty fucking Christ. Upon further internal and mental deliberation, however, fuck what the majority says. I'd say get my ass out there, track down a copy of City Adventure Touch at any reseller, whether IRL or online, as it'll run you 3 to 70 bucks, regardless of condition, or move out of something else, your choice. Yet again, who am I to force anything on anyone, right? Until then, as per usual, this is the one and only Hardcore Retro God awkwardly signing off. <laughs>